Well, we are finishing our series in the book of James, so please open your Bibles to James chapter 5, and if you don't have a Bible with you, please grab one under a seat nearby. James 5 is on page 1013 in those Bibles, and if you do not own a Bible, uh, please take that one with you. We would love for you to have it so you can read God's Word uh, for yourself throughout uh, this week and the rest of your life. Well, the next two weeks um, after this, we will have a short series on the local church. We usually do a week or two around this time of the year to just clarify our vision uh, for God's church, as God's church, uh, from God's Word, and how do we live as a gospel community and gospel culture in the world. So we'll do this by next week, looking at the whole of the letter of 1 Timothy, and then the following week, the whole of the letter of Titus. So these are letters to pastors about how to live as the local church. And then after that, we'll start a series in First Peter, which teaches us how to have hope in a hostile culture, or as he puts it, how to live as exiles um, in this world. But this morning, uh, we're looking at one sentence, the last sentence in the letter that James wrote to fellow believers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this sentence. We believe that um, every sentence in the Bible is your very word, and for our good, and for your glory. And so we pray that you would humble us to hear your word and transform us. We're praying this because we know this won't happen in our own strength, and we're prone to distraction and to putting up barriers and walls in parts of our hearts that we don't want to give up. So we pray that you would surprise us and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we can summarize the story of the Bible like this. In the beginning, we walked in friendship with God, but then we wandered away on the path of sin and death, and now God is seeking and saving the lost, those who wander through Jesus. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. He's the only one who did not wander on that path of sin and death, and yet he came so that on the cross, he would experience the end of the path of wandering, which is eternal death, and he did that for us, so that we then could be restored and taken off of the path of wandering and death into his life again and brought back. So here's something we may not have expected, though. Uh, when Jesus restores us, if you have come to Christ, he's brought you from your wandering lostness. When he restores us, he does it not just so that we would watch him rescue more people, but so that we would participate with him in rescuing more people. James ends his letter by inviting us to bring back those who are wandering away from the truth. The focus here on this sentence, we'll read in a moment, is on rescuing professing Christians who have walked away. These are people who professed faith in Christ. They were part of a church community, friends with Christians, but they have now wandered away from the truth of Christ and wandered away from His people. And Jesus calls us to bring them back. And James in this letter is calling us to bring them back. Now, the assumption behind this call to rescue the wandering is that those who wander are worth it. So if you, uh, an hour and a half from now, go home and you realize that you left a gum wrapper on your pew, you are not going to be coming back and getting that. It's not worth it, right? But if you show up home and you left your child here, <laughs> you will be coming back to get your child. If those who wander aren't important to you, then you let them go. But if those who wander are worth it, and they certainly are, then we must go and seek to bring them back for their good. So we've talked about, you know, this gathering being about gospel refreshment and how God brings refreshment to us through His Word and His people. And so the picture is of this oasis of refreshing joy, Jesus, the, the living waters, and then people wandering away from that into an arid desert and to their sure death. And this text is calling us to go get them and call them and encourage them and pray for them to come back to the source of life. 
So he ends this letter, James ends this letter by saying, you can make a difference. God can use you to bring them back. So love those who wander enough to seek to restore them. So let's read the sentence. And I'll read it twice here. It's verses 19 and 20 of chapter 5. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. He says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So this calls us to love those who wander enough to seek to restore them back. It's one sentence. There's three parts here, though. So we see the wandering path and then the rescue mission and then the eternal result. So first, let's consider the wandering path here. James has been addressing many issues in the lives of Christians that he's writing to in this letter. In one sense, we can say that his whole project in this letter is to prevent Christians from wandering or to catch them in these early stages of wandering from the truth. And then now at the end of the letter, he addresses, okay, what do you do with those who have wandered away? He brings up this final concern. If anyone among you wanders away from the truth, he says. Now, This is probably a wandering away from either doctrine or behavior. So with doctrine, the person wandering away is wandering from the truth of the gospel. So we often, um, as a church, um, identify three tiers or shelves of doctrine. So the top shelf are the core doctrines about God and his message of salvation in Christ, the things the Apostle Paul calls the matters of first importance, the things by which we are saved. The second shelf are secondary issues, still very important, but Christians can still disagree on. They're topics like baptism and God's sovereignty and salvation, uh, the role of men and women in the home and the church. And then that third shelf are often more debatable, they're preferences, they're often wisdom issues. James seems to have in mind here the top shelf issues. We know this because he goes on to say that the end of this path is death and where there's, there's no covering for the multitude of sins. So this person is wandering away from the source of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. They're wandering from the core truths of the gospel, and Christ, and the message of salvation. But it's not just doctrines on this top shelf. There are also behaviors. So when we follow Jesus, we don't just embrace a core set of beliefs, but also practices. Jesus calls us to repent and to turn away from sin. So we turn away from lifestyle behaviors um, that are in opposition to him. James says earlier in this letter that faith without works is dead faith. Paul said you can profess to know God and deny him with the way that you live. So wandering can also be a drifting from a biblical understanding of sin and holiness Paul often gives a list of lifestyle behaviors and says that if you live this way, if these things are a practice of your life, you're not repenting, then it shows you will not inherit the kingdom. You're not actually following Jesus. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then this great news, he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, declared right, righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So he says, but you have changed. And so don't be deceived. Don't think you can go back to this and be, okay, you have been washed and changed. So here's what wandering from the truth means. It's departing from faith and repentance in Jesus. It's rejecting the core doctrines and practices of the gospel. So what does it look like when someone starts to wander from the truth? James uses this language of wandering. So people wander away. And when people wander away, you may not notice it first, right? He doesn't say they sprint away though that can sometimes happen, but he's talking about those who wander. So here's four realities that people usually drift from when they start wandering. 
So I want to clarify these because we can often not notice when we or other people start to wander. So what are the four realities that people often wander from? Well, they're God's Word, God's ways, God's presence, and God's people. So God's Word. Those who wander often begin by questioning God's Word. I think Christians should read widely and be aware of alternative views um, for sure, but many Christians don't get a good theological foundation established first. They stay pretty simple in their view of things, and they don't engage intellectually with the Bible and theology. And then when they start getting exposed to a podcast that questions biblical doctrine, or they start reading a book that questions biblical doctrine, or they listen to a false teacher who sounds compelling seems right to them, but gets some core things wrong, and of course isn't going to alert and I'll say, now by the way, I'm going to introduce some heresy here, right? They just kind of start teaching, and that's how people often wander into the fold of Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or progressive Christianity or some of the errors at the heart of Roman Catholic doctrine. So God's Word, they, people, people wander away from it. They wander from God's ways, so this is behavioral or moral wandering. They start compromising with sin in smaller, subtle ways, but then over time as they wander, they get further and further away. They wander from God's presence. They slowly start no longer reading God's Word to get to know Him, to commune with Him by hearing His Word in the Bible and by praying to Him. Their prayers are no longer sincere. They also wander from God's people, so they're less consistent on Sundays or in their small groups. They drift away from Christian friendships They just seem busy, but it's clear that what's happening is a reordering of their loves and a reordering of their priorities. So if someone comes to you and says that they are leaving the faith, then think about these realities. Or if you see someone leaving the faith, think about these realities. And here's one question for each of these four realities that you can ask of them. Um, Don Carson is a well-known author and professor, and he's had a lot of peop- uh, conversations with people over time who are leaving the faith. And when someone shares this, he says that he's learned to ask a few questions of them. So these aren't, I'm going to share, these aren't all exactly his questions, but I've modified them a bit. But it's helpful to have that mindset of, what questions should we ask someone? So here's four questions to ask the wandering. First, what's your reading been like the last two years? So many people have a simplistic faith, and then when they come across an intellectual challenge to Christianity, they start wandering. But what they needed and what they do need is to learn basic theology and apologetics, like defending the faith, articulating why we believe what we believe is true. Second, is there a moral failure you feel guilty about? Actually, the question Don Carson asks is a bit more specific. He asks, with whom are you sleeping with other than your spouse? And he said that even if they haven't been doing something like that, a sense of guilt over something comes up. The reason he asked that is because wandering in unconfessed sin, walking out of the light but in hiding in darkness, can lead us away from the faith. And since we live in a culture that's having a revolution in sexuality and gender, these are often the topics right now that cause people to wander. We either want to make room for our own compromises or someone else's. Third question, when was the last time that you read the Bible? Or when did you stop praying? So leaving God's presence, communion with God, reading His Word, praying, it's part of how God strengthens us. If we drift from His Word and presence, we're drifting from a means of guarding us. And then I think we can add this fourth one, how has your engagement with the church and Christians changed? Just get their story. Tell me about how your uh, relationship with other believers, the local church has changed. Because another way that God strengthens us is through corporate worship and Christian friendship. So that's the wandering path. Now the question is, what do we do then specifically when we see someone wandering away from the truth? Well, this is, and we've already been talking about this a bit, these questions you can ask to at least talk to them about it or consider your own life or someone's. But James gets specific next with this rescue mission, and he says in verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and brings him back. So that person looked like they were standing with you in the truth, but they wander away from it, and so you then go to them, and you seek to bring them back to Jesus. This reflects the heart of Christ. Jesus said that he came to seek and save the lost, 
And when he did that, when he spent time with people who were lost and wandering away from God, some of the religious leaders of his day criticized him for doing this. They thought Jesus just came for the faithful, as they defined faithful. And Jesus' heart, though, is to restore those who are wandering away. And so he told in Luke, 13, or Luke 15 three parables or stories to explain his heart. He talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So I'll read these to you here. Here's the first story about a lost sheep. He said, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous person, persons who need no repentance or think they don't. Do you hear his heart in this? That's the point. This is his heart. Then he told the story about a lost coin. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then he told the story about the lost son. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. A father had two sons. One of them wandered away and wasted his life. But when he returned, the father ran to him and hugged him and threw a party for him and said, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So those stories aren't necessarily, as Jesus told them, talking about those who were around the faith for a while and left, like James is talking about. But the principle is the same and the heart's the same. Those who are lost and wandering, Jesus' heart is to go after, and he, and he rejoices in their restoration. Heaven rejoices in their restoration. And so now James here is inviting us to reflect the heart of Christ in the way that we live. Notice who's supposed to do this. James doesn't say that it's for the elders to do. Right? He just said, in the, we saw last week, if anyone's sick, call for the elders. He doesn't say if anyone's wandering, let the elders know so the elders can go. He doesn't say this is for ministry leaders to do or the really spiritual and godly among you. Notice what he says. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back. And then he said, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering. So it's any one of us who are trusting Jesus. The responsibility for restoring wanderers and the privilege of restoring wanderers is given to every Christian. You are your brother and sister's keeper. This is, of course, hard. Maybe you know someone who has wandered away. Maybe you've been thinking about them these past few minutes. Maybe it was a friend or someone that was part of your small group that you came to know and love and they're wandering now. Maybe it's a son or daughter, or maybe a brother or sister. Maybe it was a spouse, and you wanted to talk to them about it. You want to talk to them about it, but it feels too hard to do. So why is it hard to do this? There's a lot of reasons. You can think it's awkward because you know that many of those who are wandering don't want you to encourage them to come back. They aren't asking for you to come to them. We also fear that it could feel like a conflict, and some of us get very anxious if we have to disagree with others. We also don't want to damage the relationship. Maybe you feel like your friendship is already thinned, or it's strained or fragile, and so you don't want to upset what you have. We also don't want to come across self-righteous. We fear the person would think that we view ourselves as someone special and is better than them. Or maybe you assume that you wouldn't be able to make a difference, right? The wandering one, you think, already knows the truth. I mean, they were here. They heard it. They've left it. What am I going to tell them they don't already know? What difference would it make if I bring it up? So how do we actually do this? Well, the best guidance for how to do it is Galatians 6.1. It says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
So he says we do this in a spirit of gentleness. So here's how you don't do it. You don't treat the person like an enemy. You don't force them to return. You can't make them change their mind. You can't change their heart. So don't be aggressive. Don't be harsh. Instead, come with a tone of gentleness and love. And we need humility. He says that as we restore others, watch yourself too. We're vulnerable to temptation. We are vulnerable to wandering. And so whenever you seek to restore to them, restore someone, you have to see that you too are capable of being a wanderer as well. You're not better than them. And so you talk to them with humility. And, and this can be a very patient process. It's not necessarily just a confrontation, though some people need that. Um, but sometimes this is just very slow, patient, humble, gentle process. What can we expect if we do this? Well, there's no guarantee that you can bring them back. But James is optimistic about the real possibility here. I've experienced a number of situations and have heard of a number of situations where nothing changed. The effort seemed pointless. But I've also seen wandering people return. Some of you here may have this as your very story. You are here this morning because you were wandering and someone or some people maybe in this room gently, patiently, prayerfully we're restoring you back, and you're here because of that. Others of you have been part of a process to restore people uh, to the faith. I think of one woman who was part of a Christian fellowship in college, and then all of a sudden she got a shady boyfriend and left Christ, and they left the state, and a few of her best friends eventually drove across the country to talk to her, and nothing changed, and nothing has changed as far as I know. I think of a couple men in different situations that had close friends address their obvious sins, and these men just kept rationalizing it away and didn't change. But I also think about a friend of mine who rescued his wayward son. His son was about 20 years old. He moved across the country, started getting into spiritual meditation, all the rage these days, but for him this was an opening to demonic oppression. It seemed all very pleasant and spiritual at first, and then over time, he felt locked in, and it was clearly demonic. And his life was falling apart. And his dad got on a plane, I think because his roommate called his dad. His dad got on a plane and flew to him. And then they drove home across the country together over the course of several days. A year later, that son was set free and is a Christian and was baptized and is following Christ because his dad went to rescue him. I also heard about someone who's derailed by bad friends, drugs, and drunkenness. He knew he was lost, but he couldn't stop. He kept hiding it. And then one of his brothers, who found out what was going on in secret, um, contacted him and said, we need to talk. And the next day, his dad and brother showed up to talk to him, and they addressed him lovingly and called him to return to Christ and encouraged him to return to Christ. And he said he dropped to his knees and cried and said, thank you, God, for getting me out of this. And then he said to these men who rescued him, what took you so long? He said it was one of the happiest days of his life. I don't think those men knew he'd respond that way. There's risk. But they did it in love. A friend told me about a couple of younger men who were drifting into theological error. So he offered to just read what they were reading. They were, had some intellectual concerns with Christianity and had a view of God that he doesn't know the future and uh, really alarming kind of beliefs. But he's like, well, I'll read what you're reading in your college class. And so let's, let's read these things they read. And over time, they realized that this is terrible theology and they're now training for pastoral ministry. Uh, thankfully, God can use us even when we're not even trying hard. I think of an acquaintance of mine in high school. I think I've shared this uh, before. She grew up in um, our church, and she wandered away, and she sat next to me in class our senior year of high school. We often talked together. She knew that I was a Christian, and one day she was doodling on her notebook uh, around the, the words, all you need is love, and I pointed out that that isn't true. I actually don't even remember saying that. I didn't remember that event, but a couple years later, our paths crossed, and she had returned to Christ, and she said that one of the things that happened was that God brought that memory to her mind of her writing, all you need is love, and my comment that it wasn't true, and, she, and God just convinced her, yeah, that he was right. This isn't true. I need God. I need his love. 
So there's no way to predict the outcome. God alone knows. And there's not just one way to lovingly seek to rescue people who are wandering. But James says, you have the responsibility and the privilege of doing this. God can do it without you, of course. But he uses us and he invites us to participate. So we go to them with love. We remind them of the truth. We invite them to return. And what's the result if someone returns? That's what James says next. Jesus says there's rejoicing in heaven. And here's what James says. This is third of the eternal result. It's verse 20. Let him know, this person who goes and rescues the wanderer, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. No doubt referring to the one who returns. So you will have saved that person's soul from death and as many sins will be covered. This is eternal salvation language. The path away from the real Jesus is the path of death. Jesus alone is the source of life. So to come to Jesus, to return to Jesus, is to be within the realm of eternal safety. It's where all of our sins are covered. It's where we receive true and everlasting life. But there's something unexpected about the way James says this. Did you notice who James says does the saving here? It's the one who rescues the person. He says, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So who's doing the saving and the covering here? It's the one who brings back the sinner. That's surprising. Now, of course, God alone does the saving. God alone does the covering of sins. But he uses people like you and me in the process, and we play such an important role in this plan that we can be said to save people. The Apostle Paul said the same thing about his own ministry. He talked about um, contextualizing his ministry to different people, thinking through how to love people and bring them to Christ. And then he said in 1 Corinthians 9, I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So again, of course, God does the saving, but we are participants in such a way that we're part of it. Why does this matter? Because this is about the motivation that we need in order to actually do this. It's part of how you will be encouraged to actually seek and save the lost. God, of course, doesn't need us in order to save anybody, but he uses us. He calls us to be the ones who carry his message and embody his love in that bringing of the message. So we need this encouragement because of all the hesitancies we have. Yes, it may risk the relationship. Yes, they may be, may be offended. Yes, they may think you're being self-righteous, but the reality is they're walking toward a cliff and they don't know it. They're walking toward eternal death and they need to turn back. And if God grants them repentance, then they will thank you. So as we seek to let let this change us, here's uh, three brief questions and three steps. So we need to settle three questions deep in our souls. Do we believe the eternal significance of what James is saying here? That the end of the wandering path is eternal death, but returning to Christ is where the forgiveness of sins is, that the multitude of sins is covered. Do you believe that whoever you've been thinking of in this time together who's wandering away, do you believe that the, the stakes are eternal for them? Second question, do you love that person enough to seek to restore them to Christ? Do you love them more than you love whatever form of relationship ease you have right now with them? And then third, do you believe that you can make a difference? God really can use you as a primary vehicle, a means to bring his message to them that they might come back. So do you believe the eternal significance and stakes? Do you love that person enough? Are they worth it? Are they not just like a a gum wrapper that you can let go, but like a child to your friend? And do you believe you can make a difference? And here's the three steps to take then. First, before you can save a wanderer, you need to return from your wandering. 
Some of you here are beginning to drift from Jesus. Or maybe you've already gone far down the path. The good news is that however far away you have walked, you can return in a moment. You can take a thousand steps away. You can walk a thousand miles away. You don't need to walk a thousand miles back. You just turn around and Jesus is there. He just calls you to turn to him. So turn away from your wandering. Turn to the truth, to the real Jesus in repentance And faith. You can do that right now. You can pray to the Lord now or today. Ask Him to save you from death, to cover the multitude of your sins. He is happy to do it. Jesus said, Heaven rejoices over you when you do this. There is no reluctance in the heart of Jesus to welcome back a a real sinner who knows his or her sin. And if you're just beginning to wander, Come back to Christ. Notice the signs of drifting in your own life. Are you drifting from God's Word or His ways or His presence or His people? Where are you straying? Return to Him. Second step, identify who in your life is wandering away and make a rescue plan. Cultivate a heart of love for them. Believe that they're worth it. As a matter of prayer before the Lord, write their name down And ask those questions. Do I believe the stakes really are high for this person? Do I love this person enough to seek to bring them back? And do I believe that I really can make a difference? And then consider how to restore them. Ask them to tell you their journey. This does not need to be hostile. Be gentle, humble, patient, but express your concern and invite them to return. And then third step, let's keep cultivating a church culture that cares about this. We've all walked away from God. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And now we not only return to him, but we're used to extend his ministry and mission to save others. So we want our relationships as a church to be so thick that you know when someone's wandering. Now, in a church our size, you can't know, nor are you expected to know everybody and notice when anybody is wandering. But even though you can't know everyone, all of us can know someone. All of us can have a few people that we know well enough to know when they're beginning to drift away from these realities. And then we want to be the kind of people that invite the kind of future rescue plan that we may need. Right? Have such a posture with other people that they know, and you can even tell them, if I wander, come get me. I'm in my right mind now. I don't know if I will be in three years. So I invite you. And if I write you off, just know that I told you in my right mind today that I'm sorry about that right? Um, But we just want these kinds of relationships where we can say, if I wander, please don't let me go. Please don't stop praying for me. And that we will do that for one another as well. We want to be a church that never forgets what it's like to be lost, that never forgets that we're all prone to wander, and that will give us the humility and love to then restore others. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for being a God who loves to rescue and who does rescue. We thank you for being a God who overcomes hardness of heart, who brings us out of the darkness of hiding and into the light of life and love. We thank you for this incredible privilege of being part of your process to bring people back. And so we pray that um, you would use us to bring people to you those wandering in arid spiritual wastelands toward a cliff be brought to this well of living water and the well of salvation and they'd be refreshed by you. So we pray that you would use our efforts, you would encourage us to be lovingly gentle and bold and we pray that we would stay close to Jesus ourselves. Pray this in Jesus' name.